Welcome. The US government has just issued a climate science special report. This is part of the US national climate assessment which was originally mandated by Congress at the behest of George Bush and there have been four such assessments since this process started. This video is a summary of the first chapter of that book, A Globally Changing Climate. Well what is the national climate assessment? It was originally designed to produce a summary of the status of the climate from a US perspective. It comprised of 400 climate scientists who became the authors of those individual chapters. They used data from peer-reviewed sources and publicly available observations. It is overseen by a 60-member steering committee. The experts come from 14 different government agencies including the Department of Defense, NASA, NOAA, NSF and the Smithsonian Institute. The document is reviewed independently by experts in each individual field and there was several review cycles that went into the report before it was published. Well, what is the scope of the report? There are 16 chapters including the executive summary. They cover observations, the drivers of climate, attribution for the changes and potential mitigation scenarios. Let me read the key finding of the report. The global climate continues to change rapidly compared to the pace of natural variations in the climate that have occurred throughout the Earth's history. Trends in globally average temperature, sea level rise, upper ocean heat content, land-based ice melt, arctic ice, depth of seasonal permafrost thaw, and other climate variables provide a consistent evidence of a warming planet. These observed trends are robust and have been confirmed by multiple independent research groups around the world. In other words, the Earth is getting hotter. Get over it. They have some other findings. One says the frequency and intensity of extreme heat and heavy precipitation events are increasing in most continental regions of the world. Climate model studies are also consistent with these trends, although models tend to underestimate the observed trends, especially for the increase in extreme precipitation events. In other words, yep, some of the models are wrong, but they're wrong because they are too conservative, not because they are too alarmist. Another finding is, many lines of evidence demonstrate that it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of observed warming since the mid-20th century. And again, in other words, it's us guys, it's not natural cycles of some sort. They have yet more findings. One says the magnitude of climate change beyond the next few decades will depend primarily on the amount of greenhouse gases emitted globally. So basically it's saying if we cut our greenhouse gases things won't get as bad as they could potentially get. The next finding, the global influence of natural variability is limited to a small fraction of the observed climate trends over the decades. So you can't get out of it by saying it's the sun or specific decadal oscillations or anything like that. It's basically us. Longer term climate records over the past centuries, millennia, indicate that average temperatures in recent decades over much of the world have been much higher and have risen faster during this time period than at any time during the past 1700 years, possibly more. Now let's take a look at some of the evidence. This evidence has been gathered from thousands of studies conducted by tens of thousands of scientists from around the world. They've observed increases in ocean, land and air temperatures. We've seen many pictures of glaciers melting like these. Spring snow cover is disappearing steadily. Global sea ice, that's the combination of Antarctic and Arctic ice, has been steadily declining. Rising sea levels are beginning to impact some of our major cities. And air humidity is increasing, which can only happen as global temperatures rise. Let's look at some of the temperature data. Here we have three plots showing different sets of data gathered by, from different sources and seeing how well they agree. First, let's take a look at land temperatures. They are obviously up. And there are four data sets here, all independently taken, that get basically the same result, which is a very powerful indicator that the result is correct. Similarly, for sea surface temperatures, they are all showing an upward trend, uh, and the three data sets that comprise this agree. Sea levels are up. Again, we have four independent data sets, and they all give the same result. Here are some other indicators. Tropospheric temperatures are on the increase. Now this is the level of the atmosphere about four kilometers up. It's not increasing as fast as the surface as one would expect, but it's still increasing. 
the ocean heat content is increasing. Again, as you would expect, most of the energy from the sun is absorbed by the ocean. As I pointed out before, the specific humidity is increasing. Northern Hemisphere snow cover is decreasing. The extent of Arctic sea ice, both annually and at its minimum, are decreasing and the cumulative mass balance in glaciers is decreasing. Now this doesn't mean that glaciers are just receding, but also where there are glaciers, the level, the thickness of the glacier has been decreasing, so the mass in those glaciers has been dropping as well. Okay, what does the future hold for us? That depends on what scenario you put into the models. Hindcasting, hindcasting, which is where you know all the parameters for the climate, uh, shows that the models generally work. The observations here shown in black fit the models pretty closely. The problem comes in is we don't know what our future emissions are going to be. If we carry on the way we are, we could follow the red curve, uh, which would put us with 8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the 20th century. If we follow the, uh, say, the Paris Accords, we'd follow the blue line, uh, which would be a moderate uh, uh, emission scenario, and we'd only have 4 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. That's fairly bad, but not as bad as, as the 8 degrees that the alternative would show. If we had a more aggressive cutback in carbon dioxide emissions, temperatures would stabilize in about 2050. Uh, but do note that even if we did that, the temperatures would remain high for many decades after uh, that point. And that's because the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere remains there for decades to centuries. We also have a whole bunch of unknowns that we can't put in the models and they affect the outcomes of these models. We don't know, for example, how big the next El Nino or La Nina cycle is going to be and how long it will last. And that affects the uh, local temperatures quite a lot. We have something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and we just went into the warm phase of that. Now that means that we have about 30 years of this warm phase to come. Volcanic eruptions cool the planet for a time, but we don't know where those volcanic eruptions are, how big they're going to be, and how long it will cool the climate. So that's another thing that would affect the, re the accuracy of the models that we can't put into them. And lastly, there's economic activity. If we should have another economic turndown like we had in 2007 and 2008, economic activity would uh, decrease and global carbon emissions would decrease in unison with them. Equally, if we have a gangbuster economy, then carbon uh, emissions would increase and it would make the temperature situation worse. As I mentioned before, we've seen an increase in extreme precipitation events. That means both floods and droughts. If you look at this world map, it shows the change in annual rainfall from 1986 to 2015. There are several notable areas that are showing extreme drought, such as Africa, Southern Europe, the southwestern United States, southern Brazil, the Middle East, Central Asia and Polynesia. Meanwhile, heavier rains have occurred in the northern Amazon, Argentina, northern Europe, North Asia and western Australia. Well, just how bad has it gotten? Here's a plot of the reconstructed temperature over the last 1700 years. You'll notice that in about 1900 we reached one of the lowest temperatures during that period. Since then our temperatures have risen by about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit to be warmer than any time during that 1700 year period, even allowing for the uncertainties on those previous measurements. That's the grey area either side of the black curve. So what are our conclusions? The Earth is warming and its pace and extent is unprecedented. Recent global warming cannot be explained by any natural change or combination of natural factors. The report says that human activity is responsible for between 93 and 123 percent of the warming. Now that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense on the surface. How can you have more than 100 percent of the warming? Well the thing is that, that if you combine the natural factors there should have been some degree of cooling during this period and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is more than compensated for that, so hence you get 123%.